Okay, I think we'll get started now. Hello everyone, my name is Ore Kolade and I'm the technical manager for this session on Ag Nutrition, Nutrition Implementation Science Studies, chaired by Nilofer Fatimi. Thank you for taking part in the Energy Academy Week and we look forward to a robust and interactive session today. A quick reminder that everything you might need to access the conference materials and program can be found on the NH Academy website. So you'll notice that um, a, a poll has popped up on the screen as you um, join the session. Please take um, five seconds just to complete that and it will disappear from your screen. That's just to check you know, how many people have um, watched the video presentations and to gauge a level of um, participation that to expect um, this afternoon. Um, before Nilofa takes the conversation forward, I have a few technical announcements to ensure our experience is as smooth and interactive as possible. Um, first, the session will be recorded and posted on the, uh, on the ANH website so that you can access it um, afterwards. Um, secondly, you'll notice that you've all been muted, but please introduce yourselves using the chat function. Let's know your name, where you're joining from and the organisation that you work with. You can access the chat box by clicking on chat, the chat button at the bottom of your Zoom window. Um, we encourage you to share your webcam video feed during the session, but if you prefer not to, please add a profile picture so we can see your smiling faces. When your video is off, you can do this by right clicking on your name in the Zoom window and clicking add profile photo. Later in the session, we will open up the conversation with a Q&A session. If you have questions, we invite you to share them in the chat box throughout the session and we'll do our best to raise them during the Q&A session. If we have time, we may have participants um, raise their hand so that you can also speak up your questions. Lastly, if at any point you experience technical issues, please check your audio settings and your internet connection. You can always try to reconnect to the session using the same Zoom link. If you have a technical question, please send me a private message using the chat box. So I'll just have a quick look at the, um, the poll and see how many people. Okay, so it looks like not many people actually um, have um, watched it or the people who have voted. Um, and so um, this is just for information. So I guess um, presenters ex expect, you know, a few more questions, you know, than uh, you'd have thought since not a lot of people have watched um, the video presentations. Okay, so um, over to you, Fatimi. Okay. So, um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the ANH 2020 virtual conference, which is an experience for myself as well, because this is my first experience. Uh, but I'm very excited, and we have a very good uh, a session that will be on agriculture and nutrition implementation science studies. We have five speakers, and uh, uh, I know some. I know many of you have not gone through their research, their video, and the abstract, but they are very exciting. So I'm looking forward to hear them, uh, what they have to say in three minutes, which I think will be very difficult. But I request you to keep the timeline. So we have in this session. I'll just quickly tell you the names, and then I will later on uh, uh, tell you about their uh, research topic. So we have Deborah Alu. Uh, from University of Nigeria, Nashuka. We have Alfekra Danal from uh, John Hopkins University School of Medicine. We have John Frederick Ho John Hodinat from Cornell University. We have Nadine Bader from GIS uh, Germany. And we have Victoria Chi from University of California. So uh, without much delay, I'm going to ask these people. And just before I request them, the interesting part is that we have a mix of these their researches. So we have qualitative research as well as quantitative research, which is very um, crucial, uh, especially in health, agriculture, and nutrition, to use a combination of mixed method approach. So without much delay, can I request uh, Deborah Alu from University of Nigeria, Nashuka, and she will be talking about evaluation of health-related quality of life of small-scale farmers in Anuga State, Nigeria. Can we welcome uh, Deborah? Deborah? 
Okay, greetings everyone um, listening to this. I am Deborah, like she said, from the University of Nigeria, and it's a pleasure to present my work on the evaluation of health-related quality of life of small-scale farmers in Enugu State, Nigeria. It was a quantitative research. It was cross-sectional. It was a cross-sectional survey among small-scale farmers in five communities in two local government areas in Enugu State, Nigeria. We used the European Quality of Life 5D5L instruments and the European Quality of Life Visual Analog Scale to um, assess the health-related quality of life. Um, overall, the, the respondent farmers in this study had a good quality of life. It was actually 0 0.84 and it was comparable to the health-related quality of life for the general population in Nigeria. Then um, in terms of um, the health-related quality of life instrument actually has five domains of mobility, self-care, usual activities, um, pain or discomfort, and um, stress and anxiety. So in the domains related to mobility, self-care, and usual care, the respondents had no problems with that. But when it came to pain and discomfort, more than a third of the respondents had problems with pain and discomfort. This is a pointer to the fact that most of the small-scale farmers um, uh, carry out this farming manually. It's the manual labor, and so most of them had pain and discomfort. And then in terms of anxiety and depression, more than a third of the farmers also complained of anxiety and depression. This may be because of the uncertainties that are associated with small-scale farming in Nigeria. They have to worry about so many things like rain, pest control, and things like that. Since it's a very, very basic manual type of farming, they carry out care. So in the study, we also found out that education was strongly correlated with health-related quality of life. The more educated farmers were, were, had a better quality of life than the less educated farmers. This also points to the need for a more inclusive education policy for everyone, especially those living in rural areas who have um, small-scale farming as the major source of livelihood. So um, um, from the findings of our research, our recommendation is for um, better mental health awareness among small-scale farmers. They should be um, educated about mental health and um, educated about help-seeking help -seeking strategies. There should be, um, there should be services for, for people who have um, depression and anxiety in rural areas. And then um, better education strategies to include people in rural areas. The need for education for all cannot be overemphasized. We also called for um, longitudinal studies to assess this correlation. Since um, we have the limitation that our study was a cross-sectional study, other studies can carry out longitudinal studies or qualitative studies to explore more the um, factors that are related to health related quality of life on small scale farmers. Thank you very much. You know, for your mic is muted. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deborah, and that was a very good um, recap in a three minute about your research. I just wanted to tell, inform the other participants, uh, other speakers, that if you wish to share a screen showing some uh, 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 slide or a chart or a table, uh, you are welcome to do that. Am I right, Aura? They can share. Uh, the slides or anything that they would like to on their screen? Yes, that's correct. That's it. And oh. up to them. Yeah, to the, yeah. Okay. Okay. So our next speaker, and we'll please hold on all your questions. And I have a lot of comments, but I'm going to hold on till we finish all our speakers. And then we'll go back uh, to question answer session. So our next speaker is uh, Alfara, uh, uh, Alfara Danielle. Uh, she, uh, she's going to talk about land tenure empowerment and health outcomes among communities of the Shamba Masha intervention in Western Kenya. Uh, Askara? Hi, 
Uh, hi, everyone. Glad to be here today. Um, again, my name is Afkara Daniel. Um, I'm a fourth year medical student at Johns Hopkins, and I've been working with UCSF and the Kenya Medical Research Institute um, on the Shamba Maisha study, and uh, very specifically on a sub-study um, about land tenure, empowerment, and health outcomes among communities in our study in Western Kenya. Uh, to give a bit more background on what the Shamba Maisha study is, um, it is a, a, a cluster RCT, um, Shamba Maisha translates to farm life in Kiswahili, um, that through a multi-sectoral agricultural and financial intervention uh, seeks to evaluate whether improving food insecurity and household economic indicators can lead to health benefits for uh, people living with HIV. Um, we conducted this in three counties in Western Kenya, um, and uh, provided study participants with a three-pronged intervention that was comprised of a microfinance loan worth about $175, agricultural um, implements that included a human power water pump, seeds, fertilizers, um, and then uh, also provided them with um, education in, fin in financial management and sustainable farming practices. And uh, one of the one important aspect of this study um, that we learned um, uh, and you know had as one of our enrollment criteria actually was that because it's an agricultural intervention, um, it requires that participants have access to land. Um, however, some participants, um, especially women, uh, struggled to maintain the ability to cultivate on the land with which they had enrolled in the study. Um, and in addition to that, uh, land tenure um, has been shown in the literature to be closely linked to HIV health. Um, and food insecurity, both of which are important components of the Shamba Maisha intervention, um, which looks to better understand how this kind of agriculture intervention can um, improve these kinds of indicators. And so um, for uh, my sub-study, our sub-study on land tenure, um, some of the key questions we had were, uh, does land tenure affect how participants benefit from this kind of livelihood intervention? And then how do land access and property rights impact women in particular in this kind of intervention. Um, we did 30 in-depth interviews um, with individuals that were in the intervention arm and that had received the farming and um, uh, agricultural implements three to three to six months prior to interview. Um, and we sampled uh, to try to include people that had varied answers to questions about um, income and then types of property ownership as well. Um, some of the uh, themes that emerged from uh, these interviews included um, uh, you know, that Shamba Maisha participants described improved physical and mental health and an increased sense of empowerment um, through their participation in, in the intervention. Um, but at the same time, we you know, had these reports that people were experiencing different kinds of health benefits. Um, people who described themselves as insecure about their hold on land actually actively decided to decrease investments made in farming and land cultivation, including, including the kinds of uh, crops they selected, choosing short-term crops over long-term crops, uh, types of investments they made into fencing their land or uh, protecting, protecting their land um, for, from, uh, from hippos or other environmental um, um, aspects that might encroach upon their, their crops. Um, and uh, we thought that was you know, really interesting. We also recognize that perceived land tenure security varied among participants according to different factors, including, you know, whether they had written documentation of land ownership, um, whether their land holding um, or land access was validated within the community, and what kind of history they had over previous land disputes. Um, and then uh, finally, um, that land tenure due to a number uh, of different factors, um, including that women um, had t tended to have uh, less decision-making power in the household, uh, relied on their husbands for permission to continue to access and, and own land, um, that uh, they were more often involved in disputes over inheritance and land ownership and had lower rates of documentation. Um, women had um, quite unique challenges within the Shama Maisha intervention when it came to land access. Um, and uh, some of the really important things we learned um, really sort of honed, uh, sort of focused in on making sure that for interventions like Shama Maisha really um, being able to reap the benefits as a participant uh, requires that um, deep um, insight be like had into uh, someone's land tenure security and, and land access to be able to fully benefit from the intervention. Uh, thank you very much, Afkara. Um, that was a very good uh, uh, presentation and especially detailing some of the features of Shamba Masha intervention and uh, uh, for the sake of the interest of the speak uh, for the uh, uh, participants, we will have another speaker talk on the Shamba Masha 
uh, intervention, which seems to be a very interesting and a very uh, fruitful intervention. Um, and we see its uh, ripple effect in many other areas of the community. So we now, uh, thank you, Afkara, and we now will request uh, uh, Dr. John Hodenot, and he will be, uh, and he's from uh, Cornell University, and he will be talking on the testing, the effectiveness of combination of trainings to improve agriculture production, diversity, dietary diversity, and women's empowerment in Bangladesh, the agriculture, nutrition, and gender linkages an angel project. May I request uh, John to start his talk? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that um, kind introduction. On behalf of my co-authors, I am pleased to present the results of the ANGEL study in Bangladesh. ANGEL stands for Agriculture, Nutrition and Gender in Enabling Livelihoods. It was a two-year randomized controlled trial fielded in rural Bangladesh. There are several unique features of this trial. The first was that in addition to providing single forms of interventions in the area of agriculture and nutrition, our study also included treatment arms in which these interventions were combined. In some cases, combining agriculture and nutrition, in other cases also in, in, uh, including uh, interventions that included uh, gender sensitization components. A second unique feature of uh, this study is that most of the interventions were uh, delivered by government agricultural extension workers, um, particularly those relating not only to agriculture, but also relating to nutrition. What we find is that uh, high, is, sorry, and the third unique feature of this work is that these trainings across all dimensions involve both men and women in the same household at the same time. What we found was high levels of participation in the study, high levels of learning, with women typically reporting learning more uh, than their husbands. Uh, the interventions improved uh, the production diversity, primarily through expanding the number of crops people grew on homestead gardens. It had modest effects on improving dietary diversity, and we suspect these modest effects where a consequence of the fact is that in order to be a participant in the study, you needed to have some access to land. And households who have access to land in rural Bangladesh tend to be somewhat wealthier and therefore at baseline had somewhat higher dietary diversity to begin with. The most striking findings though, were that the, that a number of treatment arms improved women's position, women's empowerment within the household. This is perhaps not surprising in the context of the treatment arm that had both agriculture, nutrition, and gender, in part because that was a component of the training that participants undertook. But we also saw significant improvements in other arms, most notably that relating agriculture and nutrition interventions. Our suspicion is that a consequence of those interventions is they provided, as it were, neutral ground or neutral territory, where husbands and wives would problem solve together or listen to each other's opinions, and therefore, as a result, in particular, husbands gain new respect for the knowledge and ideas of their wives. Thank you. Thank, uh, thank you very much, John. Um, we will now, um, uh, I just uh, want to give a quick comment on John's presentation that, um, it was interesting to see the synergistic effect of the various intervention together, and especially in terms of both husbands and wife, or men and women. So later on, we will discuss more in detail about his um, uh, study, but thank you very much. We now move on to our fourth presenter, which is Nadine Badar. And she will. Uh, she is from uh, uh, Food and Nutrition S uh, Security Enhanced Resilience Project GIS India, and also GIS Germany. And she will be talking about what enables and prevents women from following good nutrition practices in Madhya Pradesh, India. Results from a multi-sectoral nutrition project. So she'll be discussing some enablers and. Uh, 
some of those uh, backdrops which uh, prevent uh, good success in a project. So may I request Nadeem to come up? Thank you, Nilofa, for the introduction. So yes, my name is Nadine, and I would like to share some slides, which is actually not possible. So I wanted to ask a technical team, is there any scope to um, access my presentation that I can share my screen? At the bottom of your screen, you might see share screen. Are you exactly. using that? Yes, but it's saying the browser is preventing access to share the screen. I can also do it without. I just wanted to know if there is any option from the hosts that I can get access to share my screen. Um, you should be able to because you're a co-host. So click mm, on okay. um, click on share screen. One yes, I do. And then it's saying it's preventing the access. So something is wrong. Anyways, but I can also quickly present uh, my uh, the study from our project without um, sharing the screen. So yeah, um, I wanted to present to you what are the enablers and barriers to follow good nutrition practices in the state of Madhya Pradesh in India. So GIZ is a German development corporation working under the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. And since 2015, we are working under the global program Food and Nutrition Security Enhanced Resilience in the state of Madhya Pradesh in India in two districts, where we reach out to 144,000 women of reproductive age and 30,000 small children. Our main approach to to behavior change is that we are implementing with local NGO partners and together with the State Department of Women and Child Development, participatory learning and action nutrition trainings. They have the objective to promote behavior change towards improved nutrition and hygiene practices, especially our outcome indicator in this project is um, to increase dietary diversity of women and of children. So the target group of these nutrition trainings are women of reproductive age, and they are trained by Anganwadi workers. They are here the local frontline workers and reaching out to the women at village level. So what we did with our local NGO partners, we trained these Anganwadi workers in facilitating conducting these participatory learning and action nutrition trainings with women using different tools to engage women. For example, doing role plays, a power walk or cooking demonstrations and so on. So this um, approach contains 20 trainings split in four phases and happening once in a month. So we could institutionalize this training approach with our local with the state department so that this is um, a regular meeting happening now. So however in 2018 we did a midline survey in our project area and we could identify that there is a knowledge action gap. So we looked into the knowledge of women, what they gained, like, for example, on um, dietary diversity, if they know about consuming five food groups a day, the same applies for children. If they know that their children should um, consume at least four food groups a day, we could see that more than 80%, um, uh, for example, in case of the women, they would know about this dietary diversity for their children. But looking into the actual outcome indicators, like the IDDS for the women and also so MAD for children, we could see that this didn't improve as the knowledge increase happened. So that's why we actually conducted a qualitative study, a social behavior change study, to identify what are the barriers and what are the um, enablers for women to practice the promoted um, nutrition and hygiene behaviors. And we conducted in that case um, 15 focus group discussions, um, respectively with women, but also with their husbands and also with Anganwadi workers. Then we also conducted eight semi-structured interviews with some district officials, with NGO partners, and also with um, positive deviants that we could identify in our project re uh, region. And also we did 14 observations of these nutrition trainings, homestead nutrition gardens, and also some um, feeding practices. 
So what we could come up with was um, six main barriers we could identify. They were, for example, insufficient access to nutritious food, lack of time for women because they are very much engaged also into field work, for example. Then the limited engagement of men came up in uh, many focus group discussions, especially with women, but also husbands shared that, for example, their responsibility for the family nutrition ends at the doorstep. So they would buy the foods at the market, but then within the household, it's the women's responsibility. Also, we could identify that there are quite some harmful traditional beliefs. For example, that a woman after her delivery, she should not eat green leafy vegetables because that could hinder the child from or giving the child green stool, for example. Other unsupportive social norms which we saw is that women should work hard during their pregnancy or also, for example, that fathers should not express their positive emotions towards the children because this would be considered as womenly in the village community. So, and then on the other side, we also identified six enablers, which were more or less, of course, the opposite, but also we could see there's really a high motivation among, especially uh, among women, to ensure good child nutrition. On the, in the FTDs with the husbands, it was rather on the side that they want to have good education for their children. So many of them, they would rather tend to spend money on education material for the children instead of nutrition, because their assumption or perception is that the child should be well educated to have a better life. So that was kind of the result from the focus group discussions with husbands. But also, of course, of course, um, help provided by other family members. Some women shared with us that this is very helpful if the mother-in-law supports her in preparing the meals or if the husband also helps in cooking or washing the children. All of this like, were rather helpful or enablers to follow good nutrition practices. And so also women's decision-making power within the household, but also this positive deviance, which you could identify were quite helpful because they they passed on, for example, we met one woman and she shared that she learned from her father how important hygiene practices are. So she would pass on this knowledge to her neighbor or Another woman shared, like in her case, she has a lack of water for her homestead nutrition garden, but the neighbor would provide her with water. So also seeing here that there is a community sense which can actually improve the food and nutrition situation. So the recommendation of this qualitative study were for sure that we need to um, further involve men into our approach. They should be more part in these nutrition trainings. We have currently two out of 20 trainings with the community. So we're thinking on, re on a revision, like we do a revision of this training material and see in the structure if we can have more sessions where men are involved. And then also we need a further capacity building of the frontline workers because also their education level and skills is quite uh, variable. So we can also see how we can further train them to conduct these sessions in a way that women can really participate and engage themselves in finding also the solutions for themselves because the traditional knowledge and all is there. So it's kind of more a facilitation role. Um, yeah, I think in a nutshell, that's about our study. Um, looking forward to your questions and discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nadine. And it's very interesting. And um just I would um, give a one comment that uh, your your take home message, which said that we need to involve more of husbands. But I also noticed that in your abstract, you've written that we need to involve mother in laws as well. And which especially the culture that uh, South Asia culture, they are big enablers in many of these uh, nutrition knowledge and nutrition information. So I hope someone will ask you this question, how you can engage them to, uh, to uh, as a positive deviance. Okay, so we move to our last speaker, Victoria Chi, and she is from University of California, uh, USA, and she will be talking on Effects of Shamba Masha Multisecutorial Food Security Intervention on Community Empowerment in Kenya. It's a qualitative study. Uh, may I request Victoria to start? Hi, thank you so much for having me. So I'm going to try and share some slides and see if that works. Hopefully it will work. Yeah. Uh, good. Um, so, uh, as Nilifer mentioned, my name is Victoria Chi, and I'll be presenting on the effects of a multi-sectoral food security intervention called Shamba Maisha on community empowerment in Kenya. 
So many areas of the world, as you might know, have a high burden of both food insecurity and HIV. And the combined effects of these two conditions cause detrimental effects on entire communities. So in this study, we examine whether improving food security for individuals living with HIV might create positive change on a community level and the mechanisms through which it can do so. So this qualitative study was embedded within the larger Shamba Maisha study, which Apkara sort of already gave a summary of. Um, so just in brief, again, this was a randomized control trial conducted with over 700 participants living with HIV and food insecurity in Western Kenya. And the intervention entailed providing asset loans for farm commodities, um, a water pump, as well as agricultural and finance trainings in order to help participants achieve food security. So at the end of the study, we conducted 40 interviews with intervention participants and analyzed data from these interviews through both a deductive and an inductive approach. So here are just some example quotes from participants. Um, what we found was that participants who successfully achieved food security were now able to save money because they didn't need to spend it all on food, um, as well as to earn money um, through selling crops. So upon achieving food security, they began turning to their friends, family, and neighbors um, to help those who were less fortunate. They also prioritized paying school fees for their children, as well as the, uh, the children of relatives. Um, so these are just two of the many different ways that participants started to give back to the community. So this is the overall model for how achievement of food security for individuals can affect their communities that we found through the study. Um, so people who achieved food security could now teach others how to farm. Um, they became elected leaders in their communities and they gave freely to those who needed it. Um, participants also sponsored the education of their children and other children in the community, provided and sold food to others in order to improve community level food security, um, employed other local people on their farms, as well as invested in women's empowerment groups. The caveat to all of this that we can talk about um, in the discussion part of this session is that there were some gender differences in how participants were able to give back to their communities. So ultimately, this intervention was initially established to assess the effects of improving food security for individual people affected by HIV. But we now know through the study that helping even a single person achieve food security can create a ripple effect that lifts up many others in the community. So in conclusion, food improvement of food security for individuals can strengthen areas that have been ravaged by a high burden of both HIV and food insecurity. There are still many limitations to the study um, and gender inequities, of course, continue to exist, which only means that there are many opportunities to build upon this research and to implement future initiatives like this one that can hopefully strengthen communities around the world. Um, so that was the study in brief and thank you so much for listening and I look forward to our discussion. Okay, thank you very much, Victoria. Uh, I guess now we can uh, start the question answer session. Is that correct? Where is my logistic administrator? Yes, you can get the Q&A session. Okay, okay, okay. That's, uh, so um, I will uh, look into my, uh, uh, let me just give me a second and then, okay. Okay, I can also look at my, okay. Uh, so we have a, uh, we have a question from Ishaat Abdu. Um, and I think uh, it is addressed, was the European tool validated in Nigeria or similar contacts? I think this is the, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I think this Deborah, is the, for for, oh, this is for Deborah, right. This is the question, this is the questionnaire that she used in her evaluation of health related quality of life for small scale farmers to look at the depression and other mental health issues, right? Uh, yes. So, so Debra, can you answer this question? Okay. Okay, so for the study, we use the European um, Quality of Life Scale, EQ5D5L. It contains five domains. It, it aims to assess quality of life in terms of five domains. The first domain is related to mobility, the second self-care, 
The third is usual activities. The fourth is um, pain or discomfort. And then the fifth, that's where you have um, mental health, where the respondents are asked if they had felt depressed or anxious on the day of the survey. So uh, mental health is embedded in the European quality of life scale that was used in this, so in this survey. So Deborah, I think the question is that was it validated in Nigeria? And okay. That is okay. okay. So yes, it has been validated in Nigeria. It has been used in um, different populations, not among farmers, but it has been used in different populations in Nigeria. It's been validated. It has a good internal consistency. And, okay. Uh, I, yeah. I think that's the main thing. That as long as it was validated in the context of the country where it was used. Okay, so my next question is, uh, is uh, the next question is from Harbert. And I think it's, uh, she just, uh, Deborah just elucinate, uh, elaborated on this question. How was mental health assessed in Deborah's study? So I think we can move on to the next question because I think, okay. Uh, it's the third second the third question is from Diana Dalman. You mentioned high participation. How do you measure participation in your study? Uh, I'm wondering who is it addressed to? Can some uh... It's for John Hodinot. Oh, okay. Okay. Is it? it? Uh, John, um, you mentioned high participation. How do you measure participation in your study? Do you think so we, it is for John? Yes, that's right. Okay. Um, so there are two ways. One of which is uh, we kept attendance at the sessions that our participants were uh, requested to uh, show up for. But more importantly, uh, at the end of the intervention, as part of our end line survey, we gave a quiz uh, separately to men and to women on aspects or topics that were discussed both during the nutrition BCC sessions and depending on the treatment norm, also for individuals who took part in the ag trainings. And what we found is that both men and women generally did well on those quizzes with women generally doing better than men. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, and I'm sorry, uh, I was unable to move my screen. So now I can see who is it addressed to. My apologies to the logistic department it is. Okay, so now our next question is uh, by Tara, and she is, she says, I believe you stated that you performed an in-depth interviews on 30 participants of the intervention arm only. Did you interview the control arm? This is for Afkara Danielle. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, Ren, Tara, thanks for your question. Um, so we did not, for my uh, for this qualitative sub-study, interview uh, people in the control arm. Um, our primary object objective in this sub-study was to examine the perceived impacts of land tenure on intervention uptake and effectiveness. So all participants were selected from study sites in the intervention arm um, so that we could sort of more closely examine um, through their participation in the intervention, having received the agricultural implements, um, was there any difference among this uh, particular group within the study in how they uh, benefited from the intervention or interacted with the intervention? Um, I think that it, uh, because the control arm was also required to uh, have access to land. Um, I think that in sort of in, in, in a future study or future assessment, um, it would be uh, important and, and valuable to um, look closely at the control arms experiences with, with land access and continued um, uh, land security or insecurity. Um, but because we were looking at um, how people responded to the intervention based off of land access, we focus on the intervention arm for this particular sub-study. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Afkara. Uh, my ne uh, the next question is from Thalia, and it is addressed to John. Uh, I think what uh, Thalia is referring to is the IEAS validated to, ex to assess men's empowerment. How was this done and what gives you confidence in the result? John, did you understand the question? or do uh, I, 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 I did understand the question. Okay, okay. So we use something called pro -WIA is our measurement of empowerment. Okay. I suspect a number of people listening in uh, to this session will be familiar with the WIA, the Women's Empowerment and Agricultural Index, which is an index developed by one of my co-authors, Agnes Kizembing, 
and her colleagues at IFPRI. Uh, WIA is a validated measure of empowerment based on both qualitative and quantitative work designed to quantify women's empowerment over a range of domains, uh, particularly those relating to voice, to, to mobility, and decision-making within the household. Uh, the original WIA uh, was a powerful um, uh, measure, but it took a really long time to implement. And over the last two to three, uh, over the last three to five years, Agnes and her co-authors have been working on developing measures of women's empowerment, which still have the same desirable properties as the original WIA, retain the validation, but can be administered more simply and more quickly. And the pro WIA is an example of that. And it's validated for both women and for men. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, the next question is uh, uh, addressed to both Victoria and John, and it is from Celine. And uh, the question is, how are interventions identified in terms of empowerment? I'm a so maybe we can start with Victoria first. Sure, um, just so I'm understanding the question correctly, are we um, wanting to sort of identify how we're defining empowerment in terms of our studies? Or? Uh, I, uh, the question is, like in terms of empowerment, you talk about uh, women's empowerment and how it has a ripple effect in other areas as well. So I think that's what they're saying. How are interventions identified in terms of empowerment? I, I think that's uh, what I can understand. So what was your question? Like, what were you s not sure about? So I it? think I can try and tackle the question. Okay. Just let me know okay. if I'm not answering the correct okay. question. Okay. Um, but I sort of used community empowerment and as a sort of very broad term for all of the mechanisms through which communities were then uplifted because of the intervention. Um, the intervention being um, these trainings and asset loans that were um, conducted in order to help people achieve food security. Um, but more specifically, some of the way, more specific ways that um, people could achieve empowerment were, for example, women now could earn income from their crops that they were selling. Um, and then they then went on to invest in specific women's empowerment groups in the community. Um, another example was um, some of the men who participated in the intervention um, then earned money from their crops, gave it to their wives in order to let their wives start their own businesses. So those were all kind of some of the ways that we um, identified empowerment through the intervention. Okay. Um, can I uh, just, does John want to elaborate a little bit how were interventions uh, identified? Sure. So our, our work in a way was a complement to what Victoria described in okay. that the focus of our empowerment was empowerment of individuals within the household. Okay. Uh, a feature, I, I, earlier I described how we measure that. Across our treatment arms, our hypothesis at the beginning of the study was that the intervention arm that had an explicit gender focus on gender sensitization would be the arm that would produce uh, the largest improvements in that outcome. Okay. The nature of that treatment arm was one in which uh, husbands and wives participated in a series of guided conversations around gender issues and around intra-household intra communication. The idea being is that both parties, particularly men, would learn to uh, develop a greater appreciation uh, for the importance of voice and of listening to their partners. What we found is that that intervention certainly led to increases in women's empowerment as measured by the WIA, but so did some of the other treatment arms, most notably those related to, to agriculture. The nature of the agricultural training is that men and women undertook that together. Uh, that training involved joint decision-making and enjoy, involved uh, joint problem-solving. And we suspect that the nature of those activities was also ultimately empowering for women. Okay, uh, a quick question from Victoria. How did you measure the improvement of family food security? Did you use any specific tool or? Yeah, that's a great question. 
So my study was purely a qualitative study. So um, really the way we assessed whether somebody had achieved food security and then sort of the downstream effects of community empowerment was them just telling us like, I used to oh. not have enough food to eat. Now I okay. can afford, now I have the, enough crops or um, sort of now I ha even have excess crops that I can sell. Um, but there is currently um, a lot of quantitative data being assessed um, through this, through Shamba Maisha. So that will be really interesting um, to see as well. And in previous iterations of the Shamba Maisha trials, um, they had found improved food security through metrics such as um, the children of people and families who were participating in this intervention had gained weight. Um, they were a lot healthier, things like that. Um, so that was in previous iterations where they found um, very clear examples of improved food security for in the whole family that was involved in Shamba Maisha. Okay. Um, um, I think there's one, uh, uh, I, I've been informed that there's an unanswered question about the one from Celine. Uh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, let me just, oh, I'm really sorry. Yes, yes, you're right. Uh, my apologies to Anna Mary Mayer, uh, and this is addressed to for those doing the RCT, I guess. With the RCT type of designs, how can communities choose themselves what interventions they want to be part of? That is, can they opt in or opt out or shape the intervention themselves? The RCT design comes across as a take it or leave it intervention. Is this true? or a wrong impression I have. So probably for those who are doing RCT, can any, anyone can volunteer to answer it. I'm okay. Uh, there was, how about, uh, would anybody, uh, do, do any of the speakers want to volunteer? Sure, I can I can sort of start us off and, and chime in. Um, okay. So for the Shamba Maisha RCT, um, I say that there, um, yeah. So people, you know, were able to um, uh, were approached to uh, see if they wanted to be part of the study. There were eligibility requirements, some of which I mentioned um, during my my sort of presentation. Um, and I think that one of the really interesting things that we saw when looking at land tenure and specifically, but also talking with participants about how um, they sort of tailored the intervention to themselves um, is that people uh, shaped what kinds of um, crops that they decided to plant um, based off of what they felt was going to be um, uh, most productive for them. So, you know, perhaps they pr preferred to uh, plant short-term crops that they knew would bring income more quickly over long-term crops. Um, some, some participants opted to, um, you know, use that uh, increased income to uh, uh, fence their farms or build trenches and um, invest in different kinds of ways. So I think um, uh, that, you know, participation in this, in this RCT uh, you know, was, of, of course, optional and, and dependent on the um, consent of, of participants. Um, and I think one really in cool thing about Shama Maisha was that they could sort of uh, take the their their agricultural like uh, lessons and and, and financial um, education and engagement um, and and sort sort of start to to make uh, what they what they would of it in the study and it's been an interesting thing to measure uh, and see the different kinds of creative ways people have have done that within Shama Maisha in particular. Thank you, Afkara. I'll just quickly add a comment uh, from from the RCTs that I have seen in Pakistan. Uh, Obviously, participation is not uh, excellent all the time, but I've noticed that when you use the participatory approach, especially using the uh, leaders of the community to get involved in designing the study, somehow I noticed that the participation of the members is much better then uh, if you don't, uh, I mean, if, if those community leaders or community uh, spoke people are not involved into it. I mean, that's my observation, at least where I, uh, the, the RCTs that I've seen in Pakistan. But um, is that true, Afkara? Like, did, do you think the participatory approach using for RCT especially uh, using the leaders or people who are the key people, key, key informants, 
if you involve them in the in part of the design, not design, but at least in the implementing process or the logistic process, you are you are you you see more participation. Yeah, absolutely. I think the more sort of general and community leader involvement um, that you have, um, more enthusiasm there is among participants. I think that um, in in Shamba Maisha, we also had the so Shamba Maisha study um, took place with within. Uh, three counties in Western Kenya uh, within clinics that are part of the, the FACES program. And so many of the participants that um, were engaged in the study already sort of trusted the clinics where they went to go receive a lot of their HIV care. Um, and that's, you know, how we um, sort of began to recruit and find who might be interested in being part of the study. Um, and there's also, uh, you know, work done to sort of um, uh, involve community leaders as well. And uh, I think one of the other interesting effects is that individuals would, would see um, the success of people in the Shamamayasha study uh, within their community and sort of ask how they might be able to, to, to get involved. And so I think that just general support and uh, trust within the community for studies, especially in communities like Western Kenya, where uh, and you know a lot of the communities where we were all working in, um, where there are lots of studies that happen, um, and there might not have always been that emphasis on community support um, neighborhood support, leadership support. Um, when that does exist, I do feel like people have a better experience with the study overall and feel more empowered to take things if they can in a, okay. you know, their particular direction. Okay, yeah. so uh, I, we have, uh, I think, three or four questions from Thalia. So uh, Thalia, I will try my best to try to um, take up your questions, but let me start for Nadine. Uh, uh, Nadine, this is a question addressed to you. You mentioned that this was a midline evaluation to assess why women's knowledge does not match their behavior. Many of the barriers you noted are structural and would not be changed through following your recommendations. Do you think that there would be a significant change in adopting behaviors or will there have to be structural change? Nadine? Um, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so just to add here, what we do from the next project phase on, because we learned from that, that PLA, like this participatory learning and action nutrition trainings is of course, it's an education approach. So this is about knowledge transfer, which shall motivate the participants, which are the women, to apply these behaviors at their homes. And these barriers which are shown, they are kind of not in the hands of women to change. That's why I said also the recommendation is to involve men more. So we were thinking about it, how to do that, because it needs a structural change for example. So we piloted in the last year community nutrition gardens, which are kind of facilitated through the village councils in Madhya Pradesh. So there are these Kram Panchayats and they are um, kind of in charge at the village council and they, for example, they um, there's a scheme in India called MG in Rega, I just give the abbreviation, um, which gives um, eligible people have 100 days of work. So in this community nutrition garden activity that counts as an activity under this scheme so that people who are involved would get um, employment. So what we did here, we formed women self-help groups who are maintaining these community nutrition gardens on community land. So they are, a gar they are doing the gardening themselves, but this is kind of a community mobilization approach where we involve the village council, making them also aware about nutrition, how important it is. So it comes through the community and it's not only via this PLA nutrition trainings directed to women. So we, we could see over the last year that this brought about a change only like in, in 20 gardens, but we are upscaling this now to up to 500 from January onwards. And then we would like to see how the combination of these nutrition trainings with this community nutrition garden approach match so that this knowledge action gap, which we identified can be bridged through these different entry points with income generation, because this was one of the barriers, as I said, plus that men are more involved through the village councils, for example, and plus that the women who are involved in these gardens, they also get a nutrition education, but then they also have access to nutritious food because they do vegetable growing and fruit tree growing. So we hope that this integrated approach and the connection between these two things will address these main barriers, which we could identify from the quality 
qualitative study. And additional to this, we just recently did a follow-up survey to this midline survey, so to speak. And so we will also see to what extent this qualitative uh, identified barriers are prevalent in our um, project area. So that will also be interesting okay. for us to see if these identified barriers are actually a common understanding um, or common perception in the in our target group, so to speak. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So there's another question from Thalia and it is addressed to Deborah. What do you think are the implications of finding that farmers did not report health problems? but did express problems with mental health, pain and discomfort. You suggested longitudinal studies to confirm the association, but what might be the broader implication of these findings? Deborah? Okay, thank you very much for your question. Um, actually, in Nigeria, mental health is very much underfunded. We don't have enough mental health services. And um, there have been few schemes for particular populations, for example, for students, for adolescents in secondary schools or for university students, but nothing has been done specifically for people in rural areas, for farmers in particular. So I think that now that we have seen that these people, it is assumed that people in rural areas may not suffer things like depression or anxiety or things like that. So many of these um, schemes that are being carried out do not extend to them. So um, um, from our study, we have um, seen that farmers also have some of these uh, mental health challenges. And so we call on the, actually, uh, we call on the private sectors because it's the private sectors who are doing a little about mental health. So we call on the private sectors to also extend their um, schemes and their, their solutions to to farmers, farmers as a whole can be targeted, can be a target for mental health interventions. And then of course, they can also be educated because there's still a lot of stigma surrounding mental health. So if they were having mental health issues, they wouldn't confide in anybody because it's still a very highly stigmatized um, topic here in Nigeria. So I think that with more education, with more awareness, they would be able to um, make use of the resources around them, say perhaps confide in their family or something like that before the interventions come to them. So um, I think more mental health awareness campaigns in the rural areas and then um, more interventions targeted towards small scale farmers and rural dwellers. Thank okay, you. Th thank you. Uh, I just want to check with the timeline. Uh, can can the manager tell me how yeah, I, how we've run out of time now, unfortunately. Oh, really? Yes, so they ca we cannot ask any more questions now. Maybe one more. I, I because this question is very much uh, dear to my heart and something that which I also wanted it. Okay. Uh, it is to Afkara Daniel. A quick question: Do the findings of the Shamba Masha study mean that programs will be? more successful when there is more land security or land tenureship or land ownership. Lack of land security will be linked to poverty and food insecurity regardless of programs. So what would be the implication of these findings for programs? And I'm assuming at a national level or the, the government level, what would, what do, how do you respond to this question, Afkara? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think that what we saw in the Shama Maisha study was that a sense of feeling secure about one's access to land allowed you to more successfully participate in Shamba Maisha, whether that meant you made longer term investments or um, you know, saw higher, uh, so, saw more improvements in food insecurity, um, felt the health and uh, physical and mental health benefits as well, um, because it provided a source of readily available income, self-reliance and group training and activities. And so, um, and, and the lack of access to land led to sort of opposite effects. So decreased benefits, um, inability to continue to participate um, and, uh, and, and re you know, reduced income and, and, and other uh, parts of the intervention that were successful for others in the study. And so the way, we, the, the way we're understanding these, the findings from the study um, is that future livelihood interventions like Shama Maisha should consider ways to promote land tenure security, especially for women who um, tend to be, you know, land uh, more land insecure than men. Um, and that moving forward, additional studies should aim to structure 
the framework and methodology for measuring perceived and actual land tenure security more quantitatively, um, even though you know, there's lots of literature and research um, and many sort of different ways that land tenure can be described or understood. Um, and that you know, scale up of livelihood interventions like Shama Maisha should incorporate these findings about land tenure security both in their development and then also um, in their assessment and, 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 and considerations for program sustainability as well. Because one of the biggest effects that we saw was, you know, we were doing this really great intervention, people are talking about um, some of the, benef the benefits that they're receiving, um, but for those who for a variety of reasons lost their access to land and didn't have um, any sort of um, recourse for resolving any like land disputes or, or that loss of access, uh, weren't able to continue or sustainably be able to be part of the intervention. So we think it's a really, really important thing to consider for future, uh, future and similar studies. Thank you very much. Um, uh, my apologies for the remaining questions do not to be answered, but uh, I would uh, strongly suggest to go onto the ANH website and look at all the presentation and detailed abstracts. And I, I think there are a lot of the queries that you might have ex, uh, expressed in the chat box can be answered uh, through those uh, presentation and uh, their abstract. Uh, but I would like to thank all our speakers, all the participants, and um, thank the ANH team, especially Aura, who has been very supportive because I was overly overwhelmed with the virtual chairing the session. So I think for the speakers, for the participants, and for the ANH team 2020, a big applause to them. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, make sure that you attend the remaining uh, part of the conference today and I think uh, to, today it's almost end but for tomorrow uh, make sure that you visit their website and look at all the program detail thank you very much thank you Nilafa all right thanks anyone everyone bye 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 everyone bye bye, bye everyone thank you